Eloja of Prim is easily Dax's favorite Cardassian writer. Quark's Kanar has gone bad. And Cardassians believe that males do not make good engineers. Hey, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Nice. What's up, everybody? Hello, nice. hello. My name's Ryan T. Husk, and today we are doing a review of Deep Space Nine's Season 3, Episode 15, called Destiny. It is directed by a person that always makes me smile when I see it, Mr. Les Landau. Uh, how are oh, you this today? Is a huh? Yep. Didn't pay attention to that. Or as we like to call him, Morris Les Landau. Morris Les. Ah, uh, can't help it's you. Only, on that it's one. only going to get worse from here, guys. Sorry yeah. About that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Also, I'm, quick shout out to uh, Sirach's sister. Uh, she has a store called Abyssinian nice. Kiosk. She makes that awesome shirt. You see Sirach wearing it sometimes. You see me wearing it sometimes. Also, our associate producers sometimes. You can get it in any array of colors. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Check out abyssiniankiosk.com. We will include it in the comments below. Uh, sorry, in the uh, description box below and the comments. So please check that out. Order a shirt or a mug. Pick your colors yep. and yep. wear it with pride because it looks amazing. Show one more time. Yeah, I actually have one on too. This is a different one, but. Oh, yeah, I've seen that one. Yeah. A little bit different, but you know, she's got all kinds of selections. So. I see Madagascar hanging off the side there. Yeah. The island. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, everything's good. Uh, I really like this episode, this Destiny episode. I thought it, had, it was packed with a lot of things. Um, I know you want to get into it, but I, I just really might think as well. that, yeah, might as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this thing was really packed with a lot of good stuff, and it, it was to me, it, it fits the blueprint of the kind of episodes that we're starting to come to expect from DS9, which is these episodes that that tell so much of a story, but also have this parallel to just things that provoke thought and make you question, you know, the way we, uh, as, a, as a society, kind of process information and deal with prophecy and all of these kinds of things. I think it's an excellent episode. Yeah, you know, um, I guess we might as well just dive right into that, which is the kind of the main theme. Um, and, you know, that's what makes another reason why Star Trek is so good is because they love to raise these kind of philosophical or political or social issues. And they love to not dictate the answer to you. They just love to say, here's the issue viewed from a different perspective, you know, from a sci-fi perspective or an alien perspective so that you can look at it through fresh eyes and you can make of it what you will. And, you know, there are a lot of people, I see this in, in groups all the time where people say something to the effect of there's no religion in Star Trek or religion doesn't exist in Star Trek, which makes you think immediately, do you, did you even watch seven years of Deep Space Nine? Do you know who the emissary is? Like the right. whole point is Star Trek does tackle the, you know, religion and philosophy and all those kind of things, but they kind of leave it up to us to decide is Cisco the emissary or is it all just a series of coincidences and false beliefs or, you know, and this episode really dives into that stuff in, in such a fun way. Um, and a little later on, I kind of wanted to get into something called the Nostradamus effect too. But let's talk about the religious aspect. What did you think of, what was his name? Uh, Vedic Yarka popping in. And, oh, I should look up who the actor is, by the way. I recognize the actor. He's great. Yeah, his name is Eric Avari. Mm, okay. And I thought he did a very good job. I, I have seen him many times in you know, different things. He has that familiar face. Mm -hmm. But I really, I really like the way he he did this character. Uh, what is the character's name? Vedic uh, Yarka. Yarka, yeah, Vedic Yarka. I like it um, because he has a really strong convictions in this, and his strong convictions actually challenge Kira's belief system, 
and it has this domino effect of now questioning Cisco's beliefs. And to me, that's what um, somebody who has uh, strong convictions does. They actually awaken either uh, the person to agree with them or disagree with them or start to engage in a dialogue. And I think that's one thing that he did well by proje projecting his strong convictions onto Kira, onto uh, uh, Cisco, to get the ball rolling in this kind of idea of what prophecy is about and how it is interpreted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, right away, my first thought when he popped in was, you know, when he comes in and he says, you know, whatever he has to say, and he said, even the Kai herself has, gives me my backing or is, you know, backing this. And my first thought was, well, why didn't they just have Kai Win come in and do it? But then, you know, then I thought, was she just not, scheduling didn't work, so they had to make up a secondary character or something. But then kind of lets us know why, which was that, you know, he's kind of like a disgraced Vedic. He's actually no longer a Vedic as of two months ago. So that's, that's why. But then I started thinking, well, why was she backing it then? Who knows? It's all so confusing. Those Bajorans and their rascally religion. Yeah, but, you know, one thing that wasn't touched upon in this particular thing is, 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 uh, is this kind of butterfly effect that happens. So him informing Cisco and, and Kira actually alters the course of events in itself. And then the decisions they make going forward also alters the course of events as they continue to go along. So I think that's one of the things that they don't really talk about much, but, you know, he, he's instrumental in the decision-making process or informing the decision-making process going forward. Um, uh, and, I, and I think that the writers did a very good job at kind of, talking about the idea of interpret interpretation. And I think that's really one of the critical and key elements that they tackled in this particular episode. I personally walked away with was it wasn't so much that the prophecy was incorrect, but it more so that it's incorrectly interpreted. Right. And uh, also uh, what you're touching on right before that was like a self-fulfilling prophecy which is something that the prophecy in itself kind of creates the domino effect. You know, kind of like if somebody says, hey, you need to be really careful about India. You're going to have a war with India in like five years, right? And then what does that do? That makes, you know, the, your military watch, watch India very closely and have heightened tensions and this and that, which would eventually possibly create a war with India. Would they have had the war with India had they not mentioned it? Probably Probably not. Who knows? Um, but it's one of those self-fulfilling prophecies in some ways that kind of creates a situation in which that domino starts to fall and leads into that direction. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that I, I thought that was really good is the way that Vedic uh, Yarka wakes, he kind of activates Kira's yeah. spiritual and religious uh, side where we always see that she is passionate about her political convictions and where she stands, you know, uh, in, in Bejor's affairs when it comes to Cardassia, but we don't see her so much engaged in the spiritual aspect of the Bajoran people, which is, you know, the, the other side of it, you know, she's more on the, uh, the practical side and not the, the spiritual side. Right. And in this part, she starts to really, engage in that and question and I, li and I like that yeah she uh we we keep talking about the evolution of kira's character who you know she may have the biggest evolution or, or like the the top three biggest character arts and this is another one of those tiny little flashpoints in which she's now taking a slight change from all military you know, all business, all politics, just make it happen into, you know, well, yeah, I, I guess I kind of do believe he might be the emissary, kind of, you know, like little bits where she, you know, she's softening up to Odo a little bit. She's softening up to Cisco a little bit. She's revealing her beliefs a little bit. You know, she's really in this third season having a lot of 
minor changes that are leading to a really big arc. In addition to that, I felt like Odo and Cisco had a very big breakthrough moment in this episode where I felt like um, Odo really opened up to Cisco and was honest with him to a level that we haven't seen before this. And specifically when he starts to talk about agenda. And right, yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. That agenda conversation that he has with Cisco, where he basically says, Well, you have an agenda too. And he reveals that he's <laughs> been observing Cisco's behavior, right? So that's that's the first part we didn't really we never really get any insight on uh, how Odo views Cisco. And this is a very intimate look on how he's been observing his behavior and how he thinks his agenda is to absolve himself of the title of an emissary, how he doesn't want anything to do with the, the you know, being the emissary. Uh, he doesn't judge him for it. He just identifies that as the, being the case, right? Yeah, he says... Uh your desire to distance yourself from the title of emissary. And then he also says all humanoids have an agenda of some sort. And that was what was good about that to me was when he said, you know, something about your agenda. Like a lot of times I can, I can guess where Star Trek is going. You know, we, we understand the themes. We know it well. I don't remember these first few seasons episodes well enough to remember exactly what happens, but I've seen enough Star Trek to know kind of what the themes are. And this was another one of those where it did surprise me a little bit because he said, your agenda. And I was thinking, what, what's his agenda? And then when he says, your desire to distance yourself from the title of emissary, it's like, ah, good one. Good one, Star Trek. I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't considered that one. And yeah, it works. And I, yeah, and it's, it's true. Um, and, you, and I hadn't thought of it either. And I was thinking, what is o Odo going to say right now? What is, what is he going to accuse Cisco's? Uh, agenda, you know, what is he gonna, uh, you know, say his agenda is? Um, but then when he does reveal that it is to kind of distance himself from the title of emissary, that makes sense to me. Uh, and it is accurate because that is what Cisco does not want. He doesn't want to be a religious figure or icon, he doesn't want to be worshiped in any type of way. He wants to just, you know, he, he mentioned an interesting, there was a nice line where he was saying, where you see stars, I see a comet. Where you see a, the emissary, yeah. I see a Starfleet officer. And I like that too. I like the way he was kind of going through the motions of saying, this is my perspective. I know you guys are trying to throw this on me and, I, and I'm the power, you know, the, the chosen one. But, uh, and, and this is where another breakthrough scene I think happened too, which was the scene with Dax where Cisco and Dax had a, a moment. And you can mm. tell that uh, now Dax was, um, you know, kind of saying to him, are you going to let the prophecy make your decisions or are you yourself going to make the decisions, you know? Right. Uh, and that was, that was another... The turning, that was the turning point right there. Right. That's when he, he, like, closed the book. He's like, all right, gotcha. Gotcha. And I like mm. that. I also like that scene between Dax and Cisco, another kind of elevation in their relationship, which I felt was a, a real milestone for, at least for me, uh, having more insight into how they communicate with each other and how other characters are there for Cisco, because he's usually there for other people. Um, but in this particular episode, he's the one kind of getting the counseling, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are just so many great, moments and little little subtle uh changes in there um and there was that moment when i'll i'll tell you when when i figured out what the what the trick was was when they're in the gamma quadrant and they said the three comets or the the three fragments are still headed for the wormhole i was like i got it you know the three fragments are the vipers and you know the wormholes the nest in the sky i get it you know at, at that point i got it um and it's okay you know it wasn't didn't necessarily need to be a surprise throughout um but there's also something called uh the nostradamus effect which is if somebody makes thousands of predictions 
and one of them can be interpreted as coming true, suddenly they're this great, you know, all seeing, all knowing thing um, where it's like if every single day I told somebody, you know, it's going to rain today, you know, it's going to rain today or whatever. And then eventually it rains. They're like, whoa, Ryan totally knew it was going to rain. Nobody else did. And then you sound like some kind of prophet, but really you just make a bunch of outlandish claims or veiled predictions, you know, like when they say like, and I think this was kind of a, a little take on Nostradamus because Nostradamus used to write in these quatrains, uh, French quatrains to boot. And he wrote them in, in metaphor and, and, and all these different kinds of ways of saying it rather than just saying it directly because that was during like the Roman empire and he didn't want to get killed for being a witch or whatever like that. So that's why this guy is saying, the, the vipers and the nest in the sky rather than just saying three comets or whatever he would think it is, three rocks in the sky will land in, a, you know, a celestial thing. Um, so maybe that's why he was using all these weird metaphors or something like that. But I did notice the, the Nostradamus thing in there. <clears throat> I noticed the Nostradamus thing actually wrote it in my notes as well. <laughs> and I think there's a whole lot more in that that we can get into um, mm. with the Nostradamus thing. Um, so yes, how he would write in his quatrains was very uh, ambiguous. For example, he would say the twin brothers of York will fall in the new millennium. Yeah. So, you know, you could say, for example, people have said, oh, the twin brothers of York are the twin towers in New yeah. York in the new millennium and this and that. And so, therefore, the prophecy has come true. Right. And that's why, I think, that's why I think what the writers did well was explain how um, translation and um, interpretation can alter the meaning. Um, I thought that um, there was a moment in this particular episode where Kira was being really honest with Cisco. And he's like, all right, so did, tell me what you believe. You know, you, you think I'm the emissary. And, 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 and she, she, he says, well, explain it to me how you think it is. And she says, well, and her rationale was, there, uh, the, you know, the, the prophets are timeless beings that have no, uh, you know, understanding of time. Mm. And <laughs> it would be easy for them to transmit a message to somebody 3,000 years ago and give them something that would eventually occur. So, and she was making a pretty valid argument, I thought, about for why she thought it would make sense that somebody could look into the future 3,000 years from now, right? Right, and what she was giving was a scientific answer to a potentially spiritual question. They're saying, how else could somebody possibly know oh, if your science is so smart, how do you explain this? And well, there is a scientific explanation potentially right there. Which I thought was very well uh, argued on her behalf. Mm -hmm. She didn't just go into just pure belief. She gave a very reasonable way in which it could possibly happen, right? A timeless uh, alien entity. Um, <clears throat> that knocks over clipboards with notes on it. Uh, <laughs> it's mad at you. It's like, stop talking about me. I'm not timeless. Right? I just experience it differently. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but then Cisco counters her rationale, which is I, I, another thing that I enjoyed in this particular thing. And that's where he says, uh, well, the text has been translated and passed down, which right. is also another valid scientific argument. Now, these things I would... Also, you mentioned Nostradamus, but I, I, I go to the Bible and, exactly. you know, and, and the Bible, you it's know, it's been translated I'll, a million times over right, from different right. people. And it's, it's, it's a bunch of different writers all put together. And that's why there's so many ways that these things could be interpreted. It seems like it's giving very exact and clear things, but what if, what if when it says, for example, man, you think it means, well, they're talking about men. 
But what if he just means like mankind, like man, like humans? Then it's not a specifically a, a gender specific thing. It's just talking about people in general, for example. Yeah. And so that to me is very good. They had a very good kind of debate about this, just an, an intellectual way to perceive. And her way of perceiving it was, hey, it is possible. It's within the realm of possibility that these entities can move through time, experience time differently and um, Im impose a revelation on somebody so that they had the foresight to know what was going to happen. Cisco's counter to that was, well, the texts that you're talking about have been translated and retranslated and passed down over thousands of years. And, you know, like the game of telephone, what was originally meant to be said is not what comes out on the receiving end. So very good arguments, in my opinion, for both both rationales for, for both of their perspectives. And that's why I actually, those are the kinds of discussions that I think lead to growth when somebody has a emotionless kind of very rational um, way of perceiving and arguing and presenting your, your point. Totally. To me, I, I love that, that balance. So there were some very good scenes with Kira and Cisco, Odo and Cisco and Dax and Cisco in this episode. Let's not pretend that there wasn't a great scene between O'Brien and that Cardassian lady, but uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that yeah. on the other side of this thing. What was her name? Uh, which one was it? Galora. Yes. Her name was Galora. Yeah, Galora. You're right. Uh, yeah, boy, oh boy, was that we got a, that's a nice juicy meaty chunk to enjoy yeah. there. Um, also one or two NAMs to discuss. Um, and on the other side, we'll also talk about, uh, the cutting room floor of the trivioids. Uh, but before we go to the other side, very quickly, let's give a shout out to everybody that we normally see at Star Trek Las Vegas. Um, you know, these people that we know and love that come and go every year, we see them. It's like a family reunion without the awkwardness. And right now we're not in Star Trek Las Vegas. We're all at home. We're all doing, you know, whatever we're doing, whether it's quarantining or, you know, working from home or whatever. And these are great people. We love them all. And it's just kind of a bummer not to see them, you know. Uh, so we wanted to give a shout out to all of them, right? Lots of smiling faces. Yeah, this is that time of year, always around my birthday, that we all gather together and are in the physical presence of each other. And the big thing about doing the uh, virtual Trek Con was to kind of bring us together again so that we, we wouldn't have such a void. And I think that, that was well accomplished. But yes, um, big shout out to all the people that we normally see around this time. And um, we are hoping and keeping our fingers crossed that next year we'll, we can make up for the lost time. Yeah. And we're going to name them all right now. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> After the break. After yeah. The break. yeah. Uh, also a shout out to uh, Creation Entertainment because, look, yes, it's a business, but bottom line is they're the ones that have been bringing us, to, bringing us together for however many years and decades. So shout out to Creation Entertainment and all the good people that run that convention because without them, we would not know each other. So thanks very much to them. Thank you. Um, that's it. Let's flip over the other side. We'll be right back on the seventh rule. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a very special edition of the seventh rule. We are reviewing Deep Space Nine season three, episode 15, Destiny No Child, uh, directed by Les Landau. And it's a fun one. We are, you're finding more and more that uh, Sirach and I are big hippies that love to talk about like history and Nostradamus and philosophy and stuff like that. So we try to we try to keep it mostly about Star Trek, but we can get lost and we got way more to talk about in that regard. But first, we've got uh, a few trivioids to discuss. Not even discuss. Let's just throw them out and move along. Uh, number one, Quark has to cancel his bowl fights. Quark's canar has gone bad. Vedic Yarka gives Cisco a stern warning. Uh, Eloja of Prim is easily Dax's favorite Cardassian writer. Uh, by the way, Prim, what does Prim make you think? Let's talk about Prim in just a second. Uh, Kira calls a comet a sword of stars. Cardassians believe that males don't make good engineers. And maybe the best line uh, where the lady says, uh, 
I took your overt irritability toward me as a signal you wanted to pursue some sort of physical relationship. And let's yeah. talk about that a little later because we'll get to it. What does Eloja of Prim make you think of? Prim. Uh, prim makes me think of the Prim outlets in Las Vegas. I think there's something. Yeah, prim. what it is is uh, Prim is the first city in Nevada when you're driving from LA. The second you cross into the Nevada border, some people had the idea to say, you know what? Why don't I build a casino right here so that people that are like, I just can't wait another, you know, 40 minutes to get to Vegas. I'm just going to stop here and get this terrible buffet of Buffalo Bills or whatever it is and, and gamble yeah. here. So that's yeah. whenever I said, when I heard the name Prim, I was like, oh, made me miss Vegas even more. Star Trek. Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. So you thought of the exact same thing I thought of. <laughs> that, that's what Prim makes me think of. But there's one thing that I think you left out on your, um, uh, you know how you do your openings. Yeah, uh, I, I, thought, I thought you would mention that Morn got food poisoned at Quartz. Right, that's that a good was, one. I forgot about that one. And there, she's like, I never thought anything could slow him down or whatever it was. Yeah, so he got a little uh, non-appearance mention in this particular episode. You are so right. Let, let me add that. I didn't uh, put that as a NAM. Now, what do you think about the other NAMs? We know there was a NAM for Keiko. Because uh, at the end, the lady says, you know, Gamora or whatever her name is, Gal yeah. Galadriel, Galora says. Galoria. <laughs> yeah. She says, what's your wife's name? And he says, yeah. Keiko. And she says, a lucky woman. And gives him a yeah. little smooch. Um, so that's a nam for Keiko. But is there a nam for Molly when she grabs his hand and she tries to, you know, hook up with. Except with wife and kid. Yeah, he says, I've got it. I've already got because she says, I'm very fertile, if you know what I mean. Wink, wink, you know. And he's yeah. like, I've already got a child and a wife. What do you think? Is that a nam for Molly? Uh, yes, it is a nam. <laughs> nice. I say so. Yes. Let's do it. And, um, he, you know, that particular Kardashian, she was very attractive. Uh, for a Cardi. Yeah, she was very attractive for a Kardashian. Um, she had very beautiful eyes, and they shone through in that particular uh, episode. Mm -hmm. um, and I think her name is Tracy Scoggins, but I don't want to misquote. Uh, but the actresses that You're played right. the... And I've heard yeah. of her, actually, yeah. Yes. Tracy Scoggins. She's uh, really amazing. We also had Wendy Robbie and Jessica uh, Hendra as the other two Kardashian uh, mm -hmm. female liaisons. But Tracy Scoggins, um, seen her at many different conventions. She's a very beautiful woman and has great performance uh, in this particular episode, with, especially with her eyes, which are extremely powerful and conveyed the, um, <coughs> the sexual tensions that were existing there between her and O'Brien. So I thought she did a fantastic job and, uh, should get a little bit of credit and highlight in this moment. Right. Uh, so here are some shows that you may know her from. Dynasty, and especially you may have seen her at conventions because she was in um, uh, Babylon 5, 21 episodes of Babylon 5. She was in uh, Lonesome Dove, uh, which was another series. Uh, Lois and Clark was another big one. She mm -hmm. was in a, a show, or, oh no, it's a video game called Snow job. Okay. That's all. What? <laughs> uh, <laughs> also yes. something called uh, Hawaiian Heat. So lots of lots of series, lots of cool. T and TJ Hooker, <laughs> uh, starring William Shatner. Yeah. So she's she's a she's very accomplished actress, and I thought that her role uh, here in particular was extra special and i i think that she was really made it very believable uh the two cardes the two initial cardassian uh scientists that came aboard i thought were very good um right. and then the, and then the last one was also good but not not as much to do in this episode but uh, tracy scoggins she's she's phenomenal and i really enjoyed the chemistry between her and chief uh o'brien in this in this one uh 
And it's funny because when you see the chauvinism out, out of its context, which is what we're used to seeing it. It shows male, how, how ridiculous it is. It shows how ridiculous it is, right? When you, when you see it, it in- It puts a giant flashlight right in the face of it. Yeah, and that's what another thing that Star Trek does so well. They just, they just flip the script just so subtly that it's like, okay, well, the thing that you're used to seeing all the time, what if we reverse it and it's like this? Are you still okay? Are you still okay with it? You know? Right. Now the funny thing is, is that when she said, "Oh, you know, men don't make good engineers," we would think this is what we like to think as evolved human beings. We like to think that we go, "Oh, I, I totally understand that. We've had similar feelings about women in the past." But the truth is, blah blah blah. Right. But no, he's like, "What bullshit? I'm a great." You know, it's all like, "What the hell? <laughs> what are you talking about? That's ridiculous." Yeah. Yeah. Fine. yeah and it's funny because it also i wrote down here that culture isn't how much culture is an element that defines our behavior mm -hmm. as a species and so it's not just the fact that you have different genetic material and so your skin looks differently and you have more reptilian look but it's also culturally how how that society acts and clearly, culturally, as an upbringing, you know, they believe that women are better in sciences and therefore, you know, leave that responsibility to them. And men are, you know, less proficient and, and should have, should be going to fetch some red tea for me, you know. <laughs> hey, good and, knowledge. Wow. Nice throwback to Ducat. Red leaf so, tea, yeah. Yeah. So I just felt like, okay, um, culture is such a driving force in how we behave uh, with one another. Uh, right. And that, you know, and that is another thing that is uh, pretty obvious in, 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 this, in this episode. Now there's another thing real quick that I just kind of thought of is, I mean, they're aliens. They're a completely different race. Maybe, maybe women are much better scientists in Cardassia. You know, that, to us it sounds ridiculous, but who knows, maybe, Maybe men are dolts when it comes to science. Maybe they're just I mean, group fighters, you know, and that's it. They don't, they don't have like the scientific thought. They're just better with, you know, military, militaristic analysis rather than scientific. And the women are like, you guys go enjoy your, your hammers and guns and we'll handle the, the microscopes and stuff. So that's another possibility. It, it is, but I, I really liked your first analogy when you said, hey, you know what? Uh, our culture has thought this kind of way about people before, so I totally understand the you know the misconception. Right. That yeah. to me is like is like a really articulate way to kind of draw parallels between the two. That's how we hope we would react in, in faced into that kind of situation. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's funny because O'Brien is getting his manhood checked so many times, and he said, "I was." I, <laughs> <laughs> he's like. I designed that. I did that. I'm the one who did the re yeah. What do you mean? She's like, oh, how, how stupid. <laughs> He's She's crazy. like, but lucky for you, I'm very fertile and willing to uh, hook it up. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because I felt like when once he took control and asserted himself, that was the moment where she was attracted to him, right? So it was like, the, as soon as he said, why don't you hand me that laser and I can do it and I'll show you. you know, I can, I know what to to do to fix these problems. That's when I felt the switch happen. Now she's like, oh, wow, this guy is not a dumb, you know, he's not as like all the other dumb. Or maybe she was I just did. like, or maybe she was just like, oh my God, that is so cute that he's trying so hard right now. That is adorable. <laughs> Look at how much he takes pride in his little, oh, what a little scrapper. Yeah. You're, holding, <laughs> you're holding the tool wrong. Yeah. <laughs> no, I um, built but, the tool. <laughs> I built the tool, it was a smart decision. <laughs> Uh, but no, I, I really like, and that was one thing that was also good about this episode is that you had so many different storylines um, that made right. sense and that, and that worked for me, right? I, I like the little offshoot of O'Brien. I like the offshoot of Quark and his dinar and, you know, hustling and being excited about the presence of these Cardassians and how they would multiply and make him rich. And everybody had their own kind of agenda, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Which, which would have been a great name for this episode as well, right? Because it felt like that's what this episode was about, agenda. Uh, mm -hmm. Even Vedic, 
uh, the Vedic that originally comes in to warn everybody, Vedic Yarka, he had his own agenda, right? He wants, he had the uh, peace treaty that he was working on. He wanted to reinstate his legitimacy as a Vedic. So he, he's working with a set of agendas too, right? His own yeah. set of agendas. They should have called them Vedic Yarka sauce. No? I don't know, like a Yamak uh, sauce? No, yeah, that, that we, doesn't... We, no, no, we had enough stayed in my head. Enough <laughs> <laughs> no, Yamak sauce. Um, yeah. But no, I wanted to bring back something else that you mentioned. Uh, oh, first of all, the Vedic, when he was talking with uh, Kira, had a line that I wanted to highlight really quickly, and that was, mm -hmm. he says to her, without your faith, what do you have left? And uh, there's always uh, lines like these in these episodes that are just like, you know, you can walk away with and say, all right, what were the writers, you know, this is something that the writers were trying to say. They wanted to say this specifically because they wrote it just like that. Yeah. Um, you know, and so there it is. Without your faith, what do you have left? That's an important uh, distinction for me that really questioned Kira's uh, motives at that time, right? Right, you know? especially for Kira as a character and for Deep Space Nine as a series, because it is very much about, you know, their faith, whether it's their Bajoran faith and whether it's their faith in each other or their faith in what they're doing is right. It's, you know, there's a lot of faith that's put into this series. Absolutely. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to just kind of double back on was the uh, Nostradamus. Um, right because I, I actually wrote that in my notes as well. And the thing that I wrote down was Napoleon. And from what I understand and what, I, what I've what i read, um, Napoleon was aware of Nostradamus's predictions and his quatrains and was mm -hmm. a very big fan of the material. Mm -hmm. And he actually envisioned himself as being one of the people fulfilling the prophecies inside of Nostradamus' uh, quatrains. So he, at some point, was acting in order to fulfill the prophecies that he right. had studied, right? And so we talk about the self-fulfilling prophecies and, and, and what are the decisions that we make. Are we making them based on the prophecies? Are we making them based on our own independent choices, right? Right. Are we, are we checking out that prophecy and saying, you know what? I think I'm the guy he's talking about. I want to be the guy he's talking about. So that means if, it's, if he's talking about me, then that means I'm going to be successful in whatever the thing is that they're trying to do. You know, they'll kind of right. do a little bit of mental gymnastics to try to like fit themselves into that right. puzzle piece and then believe that that means they, they can't lose. They're going to conquer whatever it is they're trying to conquer or do whatever it is they're trying to do. Right. It says it's a guy who comes from this part. I'm from this part, right? Must and be me. I'm the only guy from that part that I know. <laughs> exactly. And so, and then, so I, I just thought that that's interesting because they do use that in this, that same rational rationale in this particular episode, which is, you know, and you see it, uh, Cisco resisting it as opposed to embracing it. In the Napoleon way, Napoleon was embracing the prophecy that Nostradamus had written and was trying to fulfill that prophecy. In, in this episode, Cisco is not embracing it. He is, he's trying to go away from it, get away from it, and not, not be the person who is... Mm -hmm. um, you know, being talked about. Right. And a lot of people in his position would have said, huh. And a lot of just people in general, we, we see these kind of things and we go, okay, hmm, let me keep an eye on that just in case there's some sort of truth or validity to it. This wacky guy is saying some wacky things from some old guy way back in the day. Who knows? Probably nothing. But let's keep an eye on it just in case there's something somewhere that that connects to some truth. And they explained exactly why he was not like that was because, not because he's just closed minded, but because he was just like resisting, deliberately resisting being, you know, the emissary. He's just like, he's n deliberately trying to not embrace that aspect of kind of his job description at this point. 
<clears throat> which is interesting to me because the entire series starts on the emissary episode, mm -hmm. which is called the emissary, right? right? And in that episode, if I recall correctly, he actually gets visited by the prophets who have this uh, conversation about what is the meaning of time and what is this. And, and he essentially has interaction with these godlike Bajoran right. gods, right? Mm -hmm. So you would think that he's more inclined to believe that he is the emissary based on the fact that he's actually had a personal interaction with these with the yeah. prophets or with the gods. Mm -hmm. The wormhole uh, aliens. The wormhole aliens. So that that's kind of, it's a little bit weird for me how he's still questioning it after he, it's like, you know, if I'm an atheist, but then, you know, God visits me in a dream of some sort, then I wouldn't wake up and still be an atheist. I wouldn't say, oh, I question whether I would, I would actually have a personal reason to believe just the opposite, right? Yeah, you'd be um, like, dude, aliens came in the form of a god. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so that, that, that's interesting to me how he's still resisting something that he's actually seen firsthand that is real, right? It's not like it's an abstract thing that nobody's seen, nobody knows about. No, he actually has had interaction with it. So that's, that's interesting to me. But at the end of this episode, you can see how his curiosity has completely peaked, right? Hmm. Uh, he tells the Vedic at the very end, tell me about the fourth prophecy. What is the fourth prophecy? What does it say I'm, what does it say I'm gonna do? Yeah, right? I mean, just, just out of curiosity, because I don't feel like looking it up. You know? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I think this episode was a really good episode in, 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 in overall. Um, I agree. It was, uh, it, you know, there are a few things, you know, that I can nitpick. There are a few things that kind of popped up, but, and when it started off, it didn't seem terribly interesting to me. Not from the beginning. No, the teaser wasn't much of a teaser. Right. But um, then, but then towards the end, we get it. We understand the, the theme they're trying to bring up and they never do it heavy handed, at least not the nineties Star Trek that we know and love. They were never heavy handed about it. They just, it presents something from a, a different angle and we think about it. And that's, those are the kind of things that last for decades. That's why we can still talk about it decades later is because when you present, you know, an issue, but you don't, it's not super heavy handed and you're not fully giving the answer. They're just kind of saying, well, what do you think? that's something that's timeless. That's something that is still relevant today and sometimes even more so today than before because they're not just saying, you know, Nostradamus was real or God doesn't exist or something because then, okay, you're done. The conversation's over. They just open up a conversation that we can discuss, you know, forever. And it, I found it really interesting. Um, yeah, also, and, you know, yeah, just to piggyback on that, it's, it's, it's more like they're not telling you what to think Mm -hmm. except that they're telling you to think right and that's the beauty of of what we're watching on you know on these very good episodes they're not saying you know one way or the other preaching to you they're just encouraging you to question and and think for yourself which is which is why we walk away you know feeling satisfied or feeling like oh let me think that reminds me of Nostradamus or that reminds me of this and that reminds me of that because we are thinking right you know, you know what i tell you would be the greatest hope uh, would be, you know, if I were a writer writing this kind of stuff, to me, what I think would be the biggest win is if there was a guy that was super religious and he watched this episode and he was like, no, nah, no, nah, it's all, it's all science explained. You know, they said the wormhole aliens, you know, it all makes sense. It's all science explained. And then you got a guy that's like total atheist and watched this thing was like, dude, obviously the guy predicted this or something, you know, where they, they totally saw the <laughs> other side just based on this episode, you know, that would be a gold mine, you know, like a, a, a life gold mine if you could achieve that as a writer. And I think they have achieved it in many ways for a, a long list of things that they have done, um, addressing uh, sexuality, addressing, mm -hmm. um, you know, being in war and, and all of the things that they've talked about. I think that they have 
spark that uh, that level of thought in a lot of people. Uh, and that's why people relate to it so much. You know, th there's so much there that people can say, oh, yeah, that personally affects me because it's something that my own life experiences can confirm and uh, validate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've got uh, about five minutes left. Um, a lot more to, to discuss, some super quick hits. We got a couple rules of acquisition. Uh, yes. War is good for business. Number 34, number 35, peace is good for business. Those are two of the favorites. Um, yes. Also, I really like the line where, you know, we, we touched on it, but she says, uh, when uh, Galora says, you know, you have very steady hands, and she says, I assure you, I'm quite fertile. And he, of course, he says, what are you talking about? He's like, why have you been leading me to believe that you wanted me? He's like, all we've done is argue. Um, but then when he says, I already have a child already and a wife. Uh, and she says, you know, but you were being a jerk. I, that made me moist or whatever. And I thought you were yeah, your, was... your overt <laughs> or irritability towards me as a signal that you want to pursue something. Um, anyway, the point is, what he said that cracked me up was he says, yeah, I'm not even remotely interested in you. <laughs> and she got all, she got all yeah. mad. She's like, well, you could just finish this without you then. Yeah, uh, that was a little bit insensitive the way he yeah. came over the top with that one. Yeah. Uh, but there were, I mean, there was moments in their little banter that was hilarious. He said something to the effect of, uh, uh, she said something and he says, yes, my hands can get the job done. And I was like, oh. He's walking into the, he's walking yeah, into that Yeah, and then one. she says, I'm sure you can complete the job on your own. Yeah, well, he, he offended her by that point. And, yeah. And it's funny how, like, we know O'Brien to have this really kind of deep-seated hatred for the Cardassians, That's right? true. So that's something that's, we've known that prior to this point. And so when you see him getting hit on by, and I would say an attractive Cardassian, like, to me, she was an attractive version of a Cardassian, you know, um, version. He, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's, there are all kinds of, of them, but say, she, say that next time. To a woman. You're an attractive version of a lady. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like you as a species. No, um, I, I think, I think that, you know, uh, he was insensitive to, to her, but at the same time, you know, it's funny because he's the one, the only married one on the show, and it, it feels like he's always having to claim his wife. Like, no, I'm married, you know? Yeah. I think he's done it before in the past where uh, him and uh, uh, Sadiq uh, Bashir were on that one particular place, and the women were offered to them. Do you remember that episode? Uh, no. They said, oh, yeah. they were on some planet uh, surface, and and uh, they were being offered women, basically. Mm -hmm. And he had to, like, say, you know, I'm married kind of a deal. By the way, non-appearance, non-mention, non-anything for Bashir today. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was. Uh... But it's because they had four new characters brought in, you know, the three Cardassian ladies and the, and the Vedek. So, you know, they didn't want it to get too crowded. There really wasn't much for him in this episode. So it definitely made sense that, he was not in it because uh, there was just too yeah. many soups and or too many cooks in that kitchen. Yeah. Plus O'Brien doesn't get much uh, screen time up. And, you know, we, we, it's there's true. episodes that go by where we really miss him. And I was happy to see him get this, uh, this much screen time. It was funny seeing him in Quark's bar when they were on that kind of uh, diplomatic, you know, dinner and he's there with Dax and the look on his face was like, he just didn't want to be there. He was so annoyed by the conversation and he felt so excluded. And I just love that look, look on his face. He's, he's so good at looking irritated. Yeah. And... <laughs> what's, the, what's the male version of resting bitch face? Because he's got that. Yeah, exactly. He's got resting grump face or, or resting yeah. frump face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got it down packed. He doesn't when he doesn't, you know, when he doesn't want to be there, he lets it be known. He's know? got resting and hungover face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, 
I think we covered a lot of it. I mean, you know, oh, there was also one thing. It was uh, seeing Dax inside of the captain's chair of the Defiant. Right. You know, when, when Kira says, I want to go with you. Uh, it, was, it was the first time that I can recall that Dax is actually, you know, commanding the ship. I think so, too. Uh, another couple quick things, too. Uh, I did notice that Vedic Yarka called Kira child. You know, like, just like High Wind does. I was like, oh, that's, yeah. that was fun. A uh, couple little nitpicks was uh, that when they first gave the uh, the prediction, the prophecy, they said the three vipers will return. I'm like, how do the Jorns know what vipers are? Aren't they aliens? Mm -hmm. <laughs> These are just little things where I'm like, how do, what, how do they know what a viper is? And why would somebody 3,000 years ago say the word viper when vipers probably can't exist? It's a different planet. Uh, the other one was why did Cisco and Kira take the shuttlecraft when it seemed like the correct answer would be uh, O'Brien and one of the Cardassian scientists would be the right people to handle a scientific shuttlecraft mission and leaving the two top ranking people out of harm's way because they're going into some risky business. So that was just another little thing. But, you know, of course, it's, it just works for the story. So you try not to think about it too much. Yeah, I, I, I rationalized it in my own way as Cisco wanting to take responsibility because he felt responsible mm -hmm. for this whole thing unfolding in the way it did. And he wanted to be the one to end it. Yeah. He's like, dude, I'm the emissary. The wormhole aliens are going to make sure I don't get hurt. I'll be fine. <laughs> Kira, I can't vouch for you, but I'll be fine. Uh, I'll make it. <laughs> uh, so we're just about out of time here. Um, let's give a quick shout out to the coolest people in the world. Carmen Shamwell, TJ Thomas, TJ Jackson Bay, Bill Victor Arukin, uh, Yvette Blackman. Uh, okay. I knew it. Uh, Dennis Cott, Homer Frizzell, Eve England out in the Isle of Wight. Uh, Anne-Marie Siegel in the Isle of Manhattan. Titus, Titus Moeller and Tim Baum. Um, everybody stay tuned for the free for all, which is coming up next and we'll see you on the other side. Always remember the seventh rule. Hey everybody, and welcome back to the seventh rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. We're joined by Tim Baum, Eve England out in the Isle of Wight, uh, Anne-Marie Seagull, not on an island, Homer Frizzell, I TJ am on an Jackson Bay. Oh yeah, you're right, Manhattan, right? <laughs> yep. All right, on an island as well. Tim Baum is almost on an island. He's on a virtual <laughs> island. <laughs> and by the way, everybody, we're celebrating Sirach Lofton's birthday this weekend. It's going to uh, be a crazy party. Happy birthday. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, guys. Appreciate the love. I see some really good uh, shirts out there. Ryan, yeah. you, got a, you got a nice shirt on. I haven't seen that one on thank yet. You. I think. There you go. That right. is from Sirach's sister. And it is abyssiniankiosk.com. You can get all kinds of different colors and flavors and scents. It's kind of like those old scratch and sniff uh, stickers yeah. we used to have as kids. So it's um, Eve's. Yeah, it's, it looks yeah, beautiful. And Eve's Eve, is Eve, all. Eve, she's great with the color selection. I know, I love it. I love the stuff. <laughs> beautiful. Uh, and I'm trying to get the yellow and black one that I saw Homer have. It's another one I'm still, still looking to get. Black and yellow. Black and yellow, black and yellow. Uh, and we will include that link in the description box below, guys. So please check it out. Uh, Strock Sister makes them, and they're awesome. Well, it looks like we just got a bingo square. <laughs> 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 oh, man, that's so funny. Uh, <laughs> those of you watching, uh, check out the Seventh Rule group. You'll see that uh, a bingo card was made by Mohammed Noor, uh, with some uh, consulting by Anne-Marie Seagull and probably others. And it's the ceiling fan is the middle square. That's all you That's need to know about space. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. um, this is what I wanted to talk about. Since it's Sirach's birthday today, he's turning 27, actually, mm -hmm. the big two seven today. Yes, um, I get so I want to ask, what is the best Star Trek-related <laughs> birthday gift you've gotten or just gift if there hasn't been a star trek gift and we okay. are going to start with homer because he already knows uh 
<laughs> I guess yeah, I read that wrong, didn't I? <laughs> you did. You did. I was thinking, okay, everybody else is going to go. I'm going to have some time to think about this. Um, I, I think it's the gift of permission. Um, so that uh, Melissa has let me, for example, go on the cruise. She let me go to Star Trek Las <laughs> Vegas. Um, and that is amazing. I, I have asked her to come with me for both of those things. And uh, she wasn't able to join, whether it was dance or whether she just didn't want to really be in Vegas for all that time during a Star Trek convention. So that's what I'm going with. <laughs> does she like Star Trek? She does. Um, the, she's into Discovery and Picard. She hasn't seen Lower Decks yet. Has she seen the older stuff? She's seen a couple episodes of the original series and three or four of uh, DS9. Okay. Now, do you have to strap her down in the chair when she walks <laughs> in? Or do you, um, you set things? That's a close one. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's more like I can get you some ice cream if you'd like. <laughs> there you go Robbery. Yeah. Incent incentivize <laughs> yeah um i'll do the dishes mm. yeah that's bold yeah but as far as discovery i don't have to do anything she wants to see them in fact we've watched i think we've watched both season one together twice and uh, and season two just the one time um mm. but we have them on the blu-ray so we'll be going back through those so Discovery is uh, more of her favorite than Picard at this point? She's, yeah, Discovery is her favorite, if I had to pick one. Yeah. And I think it's one where, you know, you, you discover it pretty much the same time as someone else, not excuse the discover pun, and you are <laughs> learning about it at the same time as everyone else, so you don't feel like you're, you're left behind. behind. Right. And it takes place or was taking place before the original series. So you didn't really need to know that so much. And they kind of brought you along and introduced you to everything as you went. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you definitely don't need to have any prior Star Trek knowledge to watch Discovery because they kind of hit the reset button on a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. There, She's like, oh, those are Klingons, huh? And you're like, well... Kind, kind, yeah. I get. Let's let's go with that. <laughs> you know, exactly. It's, it's better that way. Uh, yeah. Well, Plus Pike TJ? was a good good character. I don't. I'm probably sure she likes Pike. She does. Yeah, Pike's great. She likes Burnham. Yeah, she she'll roll right into uh, Strange New Worlds. And mm, a lot of people like. Yeah, can't Pike. wait for that. Yeah. Uh, TJ, do you have a uh, a favorite Star Trek gift that you've received? Uh, let's see. So my sister knows that uh, that I love Star Trek very much, and uh, so she usually will send me like a Star Trek related uh, card or something. And so I got one with like the stars or like glittery sparkle. What do they call it? Uh, not glam or uh, something. Bedazzle. Uh, bedazzle. Yes. So it's all. <laughs> it was just a guess. The, with the stars and yeah. it has like yeah. the original Enterprise on it. And then when you open it up, it plays the theme music. Um, and then on my la the last birthday, Facebook gave me a reminder of uh, a post that she did a few years back to wish me a happy birthday. And it was all like Star Trek out, but the music was Star Wars. So that was a <laughs> the thought that, that counts. <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's great. Uh, she always uh, gives me good birthday stuff. She got me uh, a few books that I asked for as well, Star Trek related. Mm. Um, so, yeah, she, she keeps me trekked up. You know, uh, Anne Marie has alerted us to the fact that you are pretty badass on the Twitter machine, as the kids say. Uh, <laughs> this guy's got some great yeah. tweets. He's active. He's smart and funny. We love it. That's Follow what the me kids at say? Mm -hmm. TJ the Greatest <laughs> without the T at the end. TJ the Greatest. TJ the Greatest. <laughs> Yes, I was robbed of the team, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Love it. Uh, well, uh, Tim, what about you? Any thoughts on this? Well, I'm going to show my age. 
71 or 72, I received a Starfleet technical manual. Wow. And uh, I still got it somewhere. Uh, I took it to a con and got Major Barrett's signature and Marina Sirtis. Ooh. Amazing. So, but, I, you know, I remember as a kid just reading that thing over and over and over again and, and memorizing everything. No way. Do you still have some of it memorized, like a little factoid for us? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you got I the signatures the most, memorized. Yeah. I have the Kevin most obscure. Yeah. I have the most obscure uh, factoid <laughs> in, in the entire world for Star Trek. So uh, Star Trek Generation, what was the shield frequency? Oh, 0.179. No, I have no idea. Uh, 257.4 and if that ever comes up on a trivia i will be the only one that wins <laughs> i don't know man i feel like other people might know it um, I, I feel like you're right like yeah there's some way way better trivia than me but uh but i can hold my own that's pretty awesome marina kravchuk will know that one yeah maybe wow. So next time we do a trivia night with Dan Mason, we'll tell him, we'll be like, dude, ask about yeah. the frequency of the show. Nobody will know it. <laughs> uh, wait, Eve, when you guys are saying, you know, just kidding or whatever, do you guys wink or do you guys do the, what the Germans do, which is like this? Yeah, no, we don't do that. No, we, we wink. <laughs> mm, I do this. <laughs> like Dr. Evil? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we tend not to wink or do anything. You just have to try to work out whether we're being sarcastic or not. And that oh. just keeps hanging. I think that's what British people do. Yeah. That's tough with British people, though. Got to keep it hanging. I think I would enjoy I, I, that. I, 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 doesn't this mean something bad? Or, you know, doesn't that mean we got to get rid of this guy? <laughs> I thought that was this. Yeah. Uh, that, oh, that, that's, that's what it was. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, Eve, do you have any uh, fun gifts that you've received that are Star Trek related? No, because to be honest, I buy my own gift um, when it comes to buy my own cool Star Trek stuff. Um, but I'll probably, I'll probably, if I have to say sort of give an answer, I'll probably go with a similar response to Homer, I think, and just, I have, I have to sort of thank James for reintroducing me to Deep Space Nine, because then I wouldn't be enjoying all of this cool Star Trek stuff now, I don't think, had I not got back into that. So that is a great gift. So I have to mm. thank him But yeah, all of the other cool stuff I buy, I just buy myself. So I treat myself. <laughs> Do you ever get yourself your own Christmas gift or anything like that? Well, or it's worse. I make a list of all the things, but I, and then James can pick out of the list. So there's this kind of surprise. <laughs> I don't know what. Oh, and then you're always happy. So, yeah. She has a registry for her birthday. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to try that one. That's a great idea. <laughs> then you always have, you, you don't have a gift that you're like, oh yeah, this is amazing. And you hate it. And you know, you know it's a waste of money. So. Um, right. But you're still yeah. partially su uh, surprised yeah. because <laughs> like you didn't pick the exact one. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely Unless the list has the same thing written like five times on yeah. it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> earrings, 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 earrings. Earrings. Uh, well, uh, Anne Marie, that uh, leads us to you. Um, it's a tie. <laughs> Last summer for my birthday, I got to meet you and Aaron in Las Vegas. Woo! And you didn't meet Sorok? Then... That was no. for your birthday? Yeah, because my birthday is August 2nd, so it was during STLV oh, last year. Oh, happy birthday, and marie Thank you. Wow. And then this year, my brother yeah. Dan got me um, a Star Trek piano music book, which is oh. waiting downstairs for me in the mailroom. I'm super excited. <laughs> That's cool. Mm -hmm. Piano music book. Is that with the, like, the, the music in it so you can play it? Yeah. Do right, you play the piano? Mm-hmm. Mm. So, oh. such a thoughtful gift. Yeah, that is nice. Yeah, and it's then I also cool. I got myself a Deep Space Nine cuff from Walking Art made by Melissa. Show it off. Let's see it. Well, I don't have it yet. It's in the mail, uh. or it's it's pending arrival. <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool, though. That uh, that's kind of like a gift to yourself that uh, your very first Star Trek Las Vegas was 
on uh, on your birthday. Yeah, I got there on my birthday, and then I met you and Aaron and Homer at Klingon Karaoke that night. How could be? I wasn't there. I, I felt like I was there. Uh, yeah, I think I think I just missed you. Uh oh, there we go. TJ, we got you on two screens now. Ooh, fun. Which one's <laughs> Mirror Universe? <laughs> Let's see if this will do it. Got you on your computer and on your phone, so you got to close one out. <laughs> oh, it's got the knock back on. There we nice. go. All better. Much better. Nice. Well, Sirach, what about you? What's your... Uh, do you have a favorite birthday gift that might be Star Trek related? We usually go to Star Trek Las Vegas right around your birthday, so you celebrate it in Vegas. I do. I usually, I mean, it usually falls on my birthday on or about. But uh, I think the single best gift was actually getting the call to be on Deep Space Nine, which happened mm -hmm. on my birthday. No oh, way. Yeah, really? it was kind of crazy. Yeah, it was kind of that? crazy. So I auditioned for it, obviously sometime in like July or you know late July. But the actual phone call came uh, the night of my birthday, and I remember the night because my mom said somebody's on the phone wants to talk to you. And you know at that time I was twelve, and nobody called the house phone to talk to me at all. So, <laughs> so, so oh, cutest I, story ever. I was thinking, whoa, somebody wants to talk to me. Is it a girl? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it was Rick Berman, actually. Um, he was my first phone call. Uh, <clears throat> so I could tell by, by my mom's voice that she was excited, you know, and um, they obviously talked to her first, and then she said, you know, they want to talk to you. And uh, So I got on the phone, talked to Rick, and he said, welcome aboard something to that effect you know like mm. you know we, we we could love to have you uh, on on board and it was really crazy because i didn't realize the the long-term impact of that moment uh, and what it would how it would just change my life so dramatically but um just the, the excitement in my mom's voice and uh just getting the opportunity is like probably it, it's very difficult to top that birthday moment. And I remember too, that it was at nighttime. So it was like my whole day was celebrated. I already went to the gifts. I already did all that. It was almost, wow. bed, it was almost bedtime. Wow. And it was like the last, you know, the last little big present that was waiting for me. So it was pretty awesome. Wow. That's amazing. That he should have, awesome. he should have called and said like permission granted. Or something like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Then they would have said, no, this is not the guy. Anymore. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Say, is this Will Wheaton? Sorry. Did you, so you, did you even have any idea that it was going to be something big? Or did you think it was going to be like moderately big? Maybe it's a year or two. I mean, obviously, you had no idea it would be like a lifelong, you know, and a life changing thing. But did you have any idea? I uh, had no idea whatsoever. I didn't even know at that point uh, what a what a series really was like that was mm. that it was a long term kind of a commitment. Um, I was thinking more of like, well, the pilot episode being like a two part episode type pilot. So I thought of it more like a movie or a one time job at the at that moment. I wasn't thinking of you know it being the first episode in a long line of episodes. So I was really looking at it as just the emissary. Oh, I got the job. I'm going to be doing this emissary. It's like a movie. And I had done other like acting gigs where they were one-offs, you know, whether it's one or two days worth of work, but it was, it's, it starts and it stops. But this was kind of like the first time I would get into something that would be ongoing and reoccurring. So mm. I had no idea. I had mm. no idea. Wow. That's awesome. So, uh, it's a good I mean, thing you didn't get that Mike Tyson cameo because that wouldn't have topped Rip the Head. It's a very good thing. There, there is next year. There is next year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm staying away from Mike Tyson. I think I pissed him off enough. In life. <laughs> well, uh, unless you stole his tiger, 
Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I did try to go after something that belonged to him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now that sounds like an interesting story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was an accident, complete accident, and uh, I had no idea because you know he was actually in the passenger seat of the car. I, I told the story, but yeah, he I was thought in a, if memory serves, I looked it up yeah. the other day because it's oh, okay. the passenger side of his best friend's ride trying to holler at you, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you were a scrub. <laughs> uh, no, I, I actually was in my car. She was in her car, and or I guess his car. But I, I, so I he was a scrub. <laughs> I won't say that. I won't say that. I will say I'm he kind wasn't of afraid driving. that I did now. <laughs> I will say he wasn't driving, and you know the window was open. I started talking to her, and then next thing I know, I just see the the, the chair start to come out of its reclined position, <laughs> and uh, you know Mike Tyson looking at me like he wanted to take my head off. So I, I <laughs> he's I've like, hey, you want to go? Yeah. You want to go? Yeah, I, I, I literally here. ran the stop sign to get out of there. I ran the red light. <laughs> get the hell out of there. Uh, I said, I'm out of here. No you way. You see, Eve England, uh, Mike Tyson is a boxer, and the Scrubs is a song. So <laughs> She's like, I know who the boxer is. <laughs> no, but we're referencing yeah. a song so the end of the story Strock, did he end up taking off your head no oh <clears throat> no he didn't um no thank god <laughs> and i i got the hell out of dodge before any of that could happen <laughs> and um you know I, I actually we used to talk we used to tease each other um uh, you know back when mike tyson was was uh knocking everybody out you know we would say would you rather get hit by a fastball and at that time, it was Nolan Ryan. So would you rather get hit by a fastball from a pitcher or get hit by a punch from Mike Tyson? That's cool. You know? And I think, I think generally anybody would say they'd rather get hit by that fastball. Yeah. yeah. No <laughs> doubt about it. No <laughs> doubt about it. No <laughs> doubt. Yeah. So, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I made a shoulder, a nice shoulder hit, but... I think I'd take the fastball on the shoulder than, mm -hmm. than Mike Tyson. Okay. Um, that's a, that was a pitcher, by the way. This is baseball talk. Oh. I think he used to pitch as, as fast as 99 miles per hour, yeah, which is great. like, you know, a thousand kilometers per hour or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like a, it's like 160 kilometers per hour. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, we got a couple minutes left. Let's do a quick around the table about your favorite Jake moment ever in celebration of Ciroc's birthday. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, TJ, do you have a favorite uh, Jake Cisco moment? Um, does all of them? Does that, uh, does that count? <laughs> uh, I think so. No, no, no. Come back to me. I promise to have a good one. Who sang that song, Come Back to Me? Janet Jackson? Is that who it was? Yes. All right. Anyway, um, Homer, what about you? Uh, um, Eve, yep. Janet Jackson is Michael Jackson. <laughs> I know. We're just going to keep. <laughs> we're talking about baseball. We're talking about TLC, Janet Jackson, boxing. <laughs> since, we're, since we're pointing out the obvious, let me, let me point that out. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Homer. Yeah, sure. So TLC did Scrubs because I don't know that song. <laughs> yes. Really? TJ okay. wants to sing will, one line of it. Oh, that that is not going to happen. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Everyone's disappointed. Uh, yeah. My favorite. <laughs> not the first time. My favorite at the moment <laughs> is when he is out and uh, he is sort of tucked away somewhere starting to teach Nog to read um, mm -hmm. and that he's doing that and other people don't know about it. So it's not like he's doing it to get any credit or anything about that. <laughs> he's doing it because Nog is his friend and uh, he needs that help. That's a great one. It's one of my favorites for sure. Uh, Tim Baum. 
I got to say, uh, Shrock chasing around the Nah in that episode. <laughs> Maurice, I love you. <laughs> oh, you want to go out with me? Yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm in love with an older woman. Who? You. <laughs> Oh, you're talking about Jake. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't want that out there. <laughs> Jake chasing uh, Kira. Kira. Yeah. Got it. Uh, <laughs> what about you, Anne-Marie? Oh, my God. There's so many. I think, like, from immediately when we see you fishing in episode one. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Then we love you for forever. <laughs> Also, you're, I forgot to say, you're amazing in Alone Together, like on Sid City with Oh, Sin. thank you. So good. Awesome. Really good. Yeah. So like, oh, the, still, awesome. the amazing moments are still coming. <clears throat> that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I remember Brilliant. that fishing. That's the first and only time I've ever been fishing. So that cute. <laughs> From, like that moment on, I was like, oh man, there's like a cool <laughs> kid on Star Trek and it's because that, that was that never left me. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, Eve, um, any thoughts on this? A favorite Jake moment? Well, I'm I'm gonna go with rather well, there are obviously some great episodes of the visitors, fantastic sort of Jake mm. bits, but I'm I'm gonna have to go with the fact that he has given us so much to talk about and to you know enjoy in terms of his outfits. <laughs> so it sounded best. like a compliment and then uh, like er. uh, uh. <laughs> onesie <laughs> oh gosh I still have the TV guide where they voted me worst dress Love oh. it. <laughs> and, and people were bringing it to school and like literally holding it up in my face and I had to keep explaining to them that it wasn't my choice like these outfits <laughs> were well, why did <laughs> like, you I didn't choose to wear that to thing wear <laughs> Why'd and you, you know, wear that then? The funny thing is, is that like 25 years ago, what was TV Guide's worst dressed in 1995 is 2020's best dress. Now we look back and we're like, these are the coolest <laughs> things. Like, we love it. It's like, give yeah. it 20 years. It just needed to ripen a little bit more. Also, like, so gross. Yeah. Who are the people writing, like, nasty things about kids in their yeah. stories in TV Guide? Like, what is wrong with humans? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, exactly. yeah, like like literally clothes shaming kids. Yeah. You know? It's out of control how horrible that is. Yeah. yeah. Let's and write them. Like it. Yeah, it, I was <laughs> up there it was me, Urkel, and somebody else. And I you never want to be in a category with yeah. Urkel. <laughs> it's probably like Joey. What was that show? That Joey show or or was it Blossom? Blossom? Yeah. Like Blossom? Joey Lawrence? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Actually, uh, Blossom's dad was my uh, drama coach and uh, drama teacher in junior high school. No way. Yeah, her name is Maya Bialik, mm -hmm. and her her dad is uh, Mr. Bialik, who was my teacher. Wow. And so he and so he would bring her in, like you know, every once in a while, just to prove that that was his daughter, and that you know, <laughs> and that his acting coaching really worked. So. Uh, I believe them, and it worked for me too. So thanks to Mr. Bialik, Mayim's dad. Awesome. Yeah. You know, there's there was also a a reference on a Family Guy. Actually, you know what? That's not that's not right for the air. We'll we'll say that off the air. <laughs> <laughs> that is not that is not. There was a little joke made. Uh, it wasn't about the character Blossom, but it, anyway. Uh, also, real quick, I forgot that I should have said something about the uh, Star Trek gift only because I can't really think of a, a birthday thing, but because it's relevant that a few days ago, um, I think it was Trek Core posted a picture of, you know, how they're getting ready to watch the new Lower Decks premiere, and they had some of their Star Trek figures sitting down and facing the screen, you know, so we're, we're seeing the back, you know, almost like we're watching a theater and there's like the back of the characters. And one of them, I saw, you know, there was like, you know, this character, that character, and you're just seeing their backs. But one of them I could see was like a little white bald head with the blue uniform. And so of course I recognized that immediately. I was yeah. like, whoa, that's Picard and Tapestry. So that was my comment. I was like, that's so yeah. cool. I had no idea there was a Picard and Tapestry, you know, uh, toy or whatever because he was just in like 
two scenes of one episode, but it was such a great episode and such a poignant scene. It was so powerful. I really liked it. Yes. And then uh, the next day, I get a message from our friend, Mr. Casey Shafsky, who is a co-producer on Star Trek Continues. Uh, and he's kind of all around fandom. You see him at Star Trek Las Vegas. Great guy, good friend. Um, and he's like, what's your address? So I told him and he was like, and he sends me a screenshot that he, I guess, saw that comment, found the toy online, and is mailing it to me. He's like, it's arriving August uh, 11th. I'm like, whoa. Yeah. And then, so then I left another comment on Trek Course saying, oh, man, I wish I had a million dollars, you guys. Darn it. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Good luck. <laughs> Good, luck. Anyway, Good luck with that. So shout out to Casey Shafsky. That's really cool, really thoughtful. Um, you know, really appreciate nice. that. Yeah, it's cool. So starting next week i'll have it like floating behind me or something <laughs> loser picard that taught yeah. us that lesson not to be a loser <laughs> anyway um i have uh okay I, i've got my jig moment oh good and it comes with the story like always so my favorite jake moment is the episode i don't remember the name of the episode where uh he finds himself in the middle of a ground battle and he's like in a cave trying to run from these uh, Jim Hadar, I think it was. Right, it was and, the one uh, right before that, uh, the Siege one, right? The Siege on SR-72 or 71, whatever. SR-71. I think he's running from Klingons, I want to say. Uh, AR-558. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's an AR-558. SR-71. SR-71 is a black bear, I think it's a yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I love that episode because of the just the feelings that was in it. Um, and, I, you know, I like, um, you know, the fact that, you know, Jake at that moment was just kind of unsure of, you know, whether or not, you know, he was cut out for this soldier routine and being in a battle zone. And, and I mean, he's not a Starfleet guy, so he's not really sure what to do, but he's doing the best he can. And, uh, and so I just really enjoyed you know, that performance and the emotions that came through the TV, you know, with that uh, kind of, you know, being afraid and not really prepared for that situation, but still being able to deal with it. Mm. Yeah, I remember that episode. Mm. It was uh, Nor the Battle to the Strong, I think is the name of it. And uh, we filmed that in the desert. And I have some really cool pictures that I, I still have to this day, actual Polaroids of the day when makeup was taking pictures and wardrobe takes pictures sometimes they would give them to me wow. and uh i still have the, the polaroid of that day and you could just tell that i was so <laughs> like you know exhausted from the heat and irritated <laughs> by the clothes and i had all this blood on my face and you know dust and dirt and uh, <clears throat> i still have that photo it, it, it reminds me of the feelings but that that episode particularly dealt with being uh you know, the idea of cowardice and and heroism and and yeah, I wasn't gonna use the c word. <laughs> yeah, but it was it, it was it was a good thing because sometimes they, the lines are blurred on on those things and people are you know sometimes look to be heroes when they were just trying to you know protect their own life and yeah. <laughs> nobody knows until they're in the heat of the moment and that's that's what I mm. got from that. Yeah. Yeah, Tim Plus, can tell us something about that too. Well, yeah, Tim. That's yeah. Um, it's honestly the first time you get shot at. It's kind of a surreal experience. It's like, did that just happen? Um, but yeah, you you honestly, no matter how much you try, you don't know how you're going to react until it actually happens. Mm. And um, still remember most of it. That's one of the problems. But yeah, it, uh, I really did like that episode because it did point out, it's like, am I a coward wanting to live to fight another day or so? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and does that, act, that, that thing activates in you something? I mean, once you have the moment of realization, aren't you like activated into this like instinctual mode of, yeah, you are. Um, in fact, sometimes the instincts when I hear firecrackers go off, <laughs> uh, if I don't know they're going off. But yeah, it's like all of a sudden the adrenaline surges and it's, it's almost like things are in slow motion. Um, but, uh, you know, fortunately, I came out of it relatively unscathed. So uh, most of us did in our unit. So mm. 
but yeah, it's, it's, it is a surreal experience. Plus the fact that after eight or nine months of it, you become blase to it. It's like, you know, you hear a rock go off, you're going, Oh, just wake me if another one hits. You know? <laughs> wow. Wow. Ooh, that's great. All right. Well, uh, I think we'll leave it right there. We'll, uh, we'll end it on a positive note like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, hey, the positive note is to live to fight another day. Right. Yes, it is. Point, yes. The point to talk about your experiences and share the memories with people. That's that's the important part. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the since I was older than everybody, somebody got me a T-shirt when I got back that said, uh, "In a profession where men die young, beware of the old man." Nice. So <laughs> I kind of there done that yeah, and I've made it through and still waiting for the official retirement letter. But when you get it, uh, bring it on the show with us. Oh, I will. <laughs> I'll put it as my background. Yes. Yeah. Bomb, bomb is ordered to fleet reserve effective immediately. So <laughs> nice. Cool. All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much for joining us, uh, for Tim Baum, Eve England, Homer Frizzell, Anne Marie Siegel, TJ Jackson Bay, Sirach Lofton, the superstar in the sky, Aaron Eisenberg. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And always, there he is. TJ is giving him love. Uh, yes. Always remember the seventh rule.